So now, I'd like to get into the list and start finally getting into the concrete details of what the ADP methods actually are in general. Uh, I'll wind up this lecture with a broad survey of the methods, including the one I just showed you. And then in the lecture after that, I'll get deeper into neural networks and how we implement some of the simple methods of this type. So let me start. This next slide, this next slide is a first overview of what kind of methods are available in general in RLADP, useful for real-world applications. That's a very large space. It's hard to summarize all the many methods which have worked in the real world and proven to be interesting in the last few years. As the field has expanded and people have come into it from operations research and control and neural networks, it becomes more and more complicated to try to summarize everything in an integrated form. But it's important to know the big picture and to know how the relations, the methods work together. We are always relying on the Bellman equation or in variations that we can derive from it. This is our starting point for everything in ADP. The Bellman equation is always true in any fully observed ergodic system. That's where we started in the previous lecture. Now today I'm mainly going to talk about the fully observed case even though the real world is not fully observed. When you're trying to control a car engine you don't really have sensors that tell you what the friction is in certain parts of the car. There are a lot of key parameters which change, which you don't know. And a lot of the control problem is coming up with a controller that works even though you don't see everything. That's critical. The reason why I'm going to talk about the fully observed system is not because it works. It's because everything that you need for the fully observed case, you also need for the real case. So I'm starting with the simple case, but it's important to go all the way to really use this stuff effectively. When you have a fully observed system, we again call that a Markov process. In practical terms, it means if you want to know what you're going to observe, what x is at time t plus 1, it only matters what x was the time before and what you did. You don't need to know about those other variables or the past history. The probabilities for x of t plus 1 are a function only of x of t and u of t. That's the formal definition of a Markov process. But in practical terms, we're talking about fully observed systems. There is one caveat to the statement that this always applies. And I mentioned it before. If you have an infinite time stochastic process, there are some things that happen that Ron Howard talked about and in the Handbook of Intelligent Control I talk about what to do to deal with them but I won't spend a lot of time on that because that's not a, really a central problem in the field. So basically we can always assume this is true whether we use it or not. If you're dealing with this class of problem you can assume that this is true and the only question is do you take advantage of it or not. We always exploit the Bellman equation not only in ADP, but in traditional dynamic programming, and I mentioned LQG. I briefly mentioned before a key concept I'll keep coming back to, which is the concept of adaptive critic. Some people will even say adaptive critic, it's almost a synonym for ADP or RLADP. The, I, I've actually was the person who first defined this term, adaptive critic. A critic network is a network or a matrix, a parametrized system. A critic is a system which approximates this J star function or the lambda function or something closely related to them. An adaptive critic is one where you adapt the weights in that approximation function. So you have a model, j hat of x 
which is a function of weights w, and you try to model the value function in such a way that you can find the right one. There's a universe of possible functions that could solve this equation. You want to find the right function. You want to approximate it as accurately as possible. So you want to use a universal approximator so that your approximate your approximation, j hat of x and w, can be as close as possible to the true j star or the true lambda. So an adaptive critic is this kind of approximator of a value function with weights that you adapt. Now, when you start building real-world adaptive critic systems, you have to decide which system do you want to pick. And I can't just give you a list of three types because there are several different lists. There are actually four decisions you have to make in every application. And in different applications, different decisions are justified. When I talked about Fogel's example, I talked about three obvious decisions you have to make about JSTAR. You have to decide, are you approximating JSTAR or are you picking Lambda? Which one do you want to pick? Or do you want to use another alternative, which is called Q or J hat? And there are some other alternatives I haven't mentioned. But for practical work today, you mostly wind up choosing J star or Lambda or Q. So that's decision one. Three types of method. J star methods, Lambda methods, or Q methods. That's one grouping of the methods. The next thing is you have to decide how do you want to approximate your value function? And practical people working in our LADP talk every day. How do we approximate the value function? What approximator do we use? Do we use a Taylor series to approximate this function? Do we use a neural network? Do we use a radial basis function? Do we use a spline? Do we use gain scheduling, which is common in some aerospace control? Do you want to use a soft switching version of gain scheduling, which ends up being fuzzy logic? People have used all of these things successfully on difficult real-world problems using ADP. So they're all viable possibilities, good for different applications. So you've got to choose what is your approximator. And then the third thing is, okay, after you've picked your approximator, after you know what you want to approximate, you still got to know, how do I find the weights? I still need to figure out what the weights are. And there are several methods, many of which I developed originally, for how to find the weights. There are basically two broad classes of methods. I mentioned the Fogel example, which, which I think of as cheating, but it works. It shouldn't just be called cheating. It's useful today where you try to find the weights just by searching around stochastically using evolutionary computing. And there's very important practical work in electric power based on that approach. In addition to Fogel's work with chess, there is work by Harley and Venia Gamorthy in electric power, which is extremely important, connecting ADP to electric power. And they often use a method called particle swarm optimization, which is part of evolutionary computing to come up with the weights. And if the problem isn't too large, that works. It's kind of like cheating, but for the moment it's powerful enough. And it overcomes issues about convexity, which are important. In the long term, to be like the brain, we have to do better. But it's an important tool today. Where I put my effort is in a different area. Uh, I've been interested in something more like true adaptation, like adaptive control, where instead of considering a billion possible weight vectors, you adapt your weights, you start with a certain value of the weights, and you try to improve them over time. And you could do that iteratively on a computer to find the optimal controller offline, or you can actually do it in real time on a flying airplane. Both of those things have worked in the real world. Both of them are viable. Both of them have even been certified by people at NASA uh, with tough verification and validation. So both approaches are viable. It depends on your application, which you want to do.
Now, there's this interesting question, what does the brain do? And for me, that's important, because I'm really using this ultimately as a way to learn about the brain. And I may have mentioned to you before, there was a neuroscientist in Pittsburgh who was asked, which method do you think the brain uses for some computational task? Does the brain use a method like method one from control theory or pattern recognition? Or two or five? Which do you think it uses? And he laughed and he said, with the human brain, if you want to know which of the five it uses, the answer is it usually will use all five plus another five you never thought of integrated today together somehow to make sense as an integrated system. I always remember what that guy said because it, it really is a good saying. In the case of what the brain does, I used to think that what the brain does is just like this adaptive control where you adapt the weights. But as I studied harder how mammal brains solve difficult problems, I'm convinced they actually use a hybrid. You start with the adaptive control. That's the starting point. You've got to know it. It's hard. But then there is an intelligent stochastic search capability on top of that. It's not at all like today's evolutionary computing. It's a new kind of stochastic optimization that hasn't yet been developed. There are a few early projects. It's an area where I'd like to fund more research. And I have a paper on that. I call that brain-like stochastic search or BLISS, B-L-I-S-S, brain-like stochastic search. And so I think what the brain really uses is a hybrid. But for now, the subject of how to do stochastic search and the subject of how to adapt weights are both useful and they both can help us eventually understand about brains. Um, on the next slide, my last slide today, if I haven't gone over, I'm going to talk about one of these decisions, the one I didn't talk about before with Fogel. Because it's not enough to decide to pick J star or lambda. It's not enough to decide whether you're using Taylor C's or neural nets and to decide how to adapt the weights. Those are important, but there's one more thing we have to decide if we want to implement this. If you look at the Bellman equation, we need to maximize this thing over actions. When we have a control system, we're ultimately trying to decide what our actions are. At every time period T, we have to decide what U will I send out. That's the bottom line. That's what control is about. What is your U going to be? What is your decision going to be? And it turns out that there are different methods for choosing U that have to go together. So I gave you an example before. It described how to train J my simple old critic design that I did back in 71, there was a method for how to adapt the critic, but there was also a method for picking the actions. And that's another important choice in the real world. And today, just for the fun of it, I'll start with the actions. I've given lectures before where I started with the critics. It turns out that in the real world, there are actually six or seven methods which have worked in important real-world applications six or seven different ways to pick your actions. And if you ask me which one is right, I'd say it depends on your problem. More specifically, it depends on how quickly do you need the answer. There are some methods which are very fast and less accurate, and some are more accurate and take more time. And I would argue that the brain uses a hybrid of both types. And if you look at the design of the human brain, it actually turns out it's almost like two brains in one. There's a high-level thing that takes more time to calculate things. It basically runs at what people would call a theta rhythm or an alpha rhythm. Four calculations per second or eight calculations per second. And if you try to control a hand, at a rate of 4 hertz, 4 calculations per second, you're going to get Parkinson's disease. It won't work very well. But the intelligent higher part operates at that kind of speed. But there's a lower part called the cerebellum, the pons, the motor system, which is much faster. 
and it can smooth things out to run at about 200 hertz, which is what you need to control your hand. So there's a fast ADP system, which controls the hand, and a slower one, which develops a better idea of where you want the hand to go. It's like two brains in one, and I would argue two ADP systems in one. Okay? So you need the fast method, and you need the slow method, and ultimately you need to combine them. I gave method zero here. <laughs> in this course, I promise I'm going to focus on discrete time. It's mathematically easier. When we use computers, we're kind of stuck with discrete time. But to be complete, I need to mention continuous time. The fastest control of all is if you can react instantaneously without waiting for a computer cycle, if you can do it with differential equations. And a lot of mathematical control theory assumes that you can react instantaneously. It's a lot easier to prove stability theorems if you can do that. And if you don't use computers, if you use analog circuit elements like those old servos, you might want to describe those guys in differential equations that look like continuous time. So the fastest method of all is to use continuous time control. I won't talk a lot more about it, but today I need to make a few basic points because this is important. If you want to know more about continuous time ADP, there are two major sources that you can rely on which are very important sources. There are the chapters by Lewis and also Sarangapani and others in this new book by Lewis and Liu, which I mentioned several times. It comes out in 2012. There is also a paper on the web, which is free. You don't have to buy it. Um, there's a website called archive.org which has a nice search engine, it's a big digital library, and in that site I have a paper with the code ADAPTORG981001 and that has like 200 equations. If you like stability theorems it has them and it has continuous time versions of the methods I'll be talking about in this course. That paper is a little more demanding mathematically than some of the other things I'll talk about in this course but it does have robust stability theorems. It combines adaptable, optimal, and robust control mathematically with theorems. So these are two very important sources. As a general rule, I have the impression that the best continuous time methods are pretty much the same as the best fast discrete time methods. So ultimately there isn't that much difference and you really won't lose a lot in practical terms by focusing on the easier case of discrete time. But if you want to go ahead to look at the continuous case, you can look at those sources which I won't get into heavily in this course. So that's method zero. Um, actually, well maybe I should say a little bit more about method zero. One of the things I show in this ADAPT.org paper, I show new forms of adaptive LQG case. Even in the linear quadratic case, adaptive control turns out to be very difficult. If you read the book by Narendra and Anaswamy, you'll see chapters for the single input, single output case, which are very clear and easy to read. If you read ahead to the multi-input, multi-output case, there are strong stability theorems, but it's hard to figure out what they mean. And leaders in adaptive control have come up to me and said, you know, maybe Narendra has oversold this a little. We haven't really solved the linear case completely. We can guarantee stability for linear adaptive control if you meet all kinds of curious conditions including knowledge of the structure and other things, we don't really have a method for linear adaptive control in the linear quadratic case, which is stable in practice for the whole class of problems that Bryson and Ho are looking at. Any controllable system you can control using LQG if you know the matrix. Why can't we do the same thing in adaptive control, even in the linear case? And the answer is we can, and I have developed new methods which do do that in the continuous case, and those are in this paper. 
Right? So you can do adaptive LQG control as stable as fixed LQG control using those methods. So that, that, that could be of interest to people in that area. But now let me move on to the methods we're going to talk about in this course, where we're not using servo motors. The fastest method, which is the one I have used the most, is to rely on something which I have called an action network, and others abbreviated as actor, and some people would just say, hey, it's a controller. In the flowchart I showed you earlier, I showed an action network that outputs the controls, and it's the same thing as what Narendra called the controller in his adaptive control design. It's the thing that outputs the actions. It does the real work. It's where the real control gains are. This network basically is trying to approximate the optimal policy. And the idea here is we can do with policies the same thing we're doing with the critics. We can try to explore the universe of possible actions. If we have a computer chip which implements neural networks, it has certain weights in it. Instead of asking what is the ideal mathematical function which would take forever to compute, when we're doing control real time on the fly, what we want is the best control that we can implement on the fast chip that we have. That fast chip has certain weights or parameters. And our job is to tune the weights or parameters on that control chip to get the best possible performance. So what we have is a parameterized policy or action network. And our job is to try to find the weights that make this as close as possible to the best control. Optimal policy, optimal strategy, whatever you want to call it. And if you want the fastest control, if time is your constraint, you want this to be a feed-forward calculation that's guaranteed to come up with a new value in one millisecond, say, you know, you have a sample time, you want the best value you can get from one chip in one millisecond, you want a feed-forward action network, and your job is to find the parameters that get the best possible work out of this action network. And when I started work studying brains, I said, you know, it's the same thing with a brain. You have to move your hand. You've got to decide in a millisecond or in a hundredth of a second or a quarter of a second. You've got to make a decision within that time frame. You have a network. The network makes the decisions. You want to adapt the weights of your physical network or your chip to get the best performance you can. There's an important choice here, though. Even at this level, if you're going to use an action network, if it's a neural network, or even an equation solver, you still have to choose, do you want something which is feed-forward or recurrent? And I'm going to need to use those words more and more. Feed-forward is the fastest possibility, where it's predictable. Step one, step two, step three, and you know you're done at step ten. It's feeding forward it's predictable, you know when you're going to get to the end of your calculation. Recurrent is when you might iterate. And there are a lot of times when you need to iterate to get to the best value. And maybe you have a feed-forward start, but you want to iterate to try to do better. In the brain, I would argue that the cerebellum, the fast system, uses feed-forward networks because the time constraint is severe. But at the higher level, Neuroscientists have shown we use recurrent networks where they iterate a lot. So there are two variations of this. I will show you the math mathematics for adapting an action network in general, but if you plug in a feed-forward network, it'll be fast. If you plug in a recurrent network, it'll take more time, but it'll give you a better approximation. And the best system of all is a hybrid between the two to use both of them, but in your application, fast, Feed forward may be good enough, or you may have enough time to use a slow and better recurrent network. So that's a second way to come up with your actions. Another way of coming up with actions is very popular in the computer science literature. In fact, if you try to look around, Google around, to see what they say about reinforcement learning, you'll come up with these methods that mostly don't solve real-world problems, mostly too simple but they're easy to understand and they're very popular for that reason.
And in those cases, your choice is very simple. There are applications where your choices are just one number. This is like traditional dynamic programming. One number from a set of n numbers. And a lot of people say they're doing RLADP when really they're just doing traditional dynamic programming. And that's the way they should think of their work. Uh, in a case like that, you can just simply evaluate all options. If you have a computer doing chess, you consider every possible move you take right now, evaluate the resulting state of the board, and you're home free. You can consider every possibility. And in Fogel's case, you could even consider a tree of possibilities. So sometimes you can enumerate all the possibilities. Third possibility. There is a special case which has become very important in aerospace engineering. In this special case, it may turn out that u plus j, the expected value of u plus j, is quadratic in your action. That happens if you're dealing with a very fast system, almost continuous time. If you have a very fast system, the critic tells you which way you want to go, and your action is kind of specifying how hard you push on the throttle. And the reason you don't push on the throttle right to the limit to get right where you want to go is that it costs energy and problems when you push too hard. It may cost fuel. So the reason you don't push on the throttle too hard is that your utility function is quadratic in your action. Too much action, you pay a penalty right away. So if you have the kind of system which is mostly continuous and smooth and the cost of the action is quadratic, to find the optimal action U, once you know the outputs of the critic, once you know your lambdas, once you know your lambdas, then the problem of finding the right U is just a simple quadratic optimization problem. While minimizing a quadratic, that's basic calculus. You can work out the algebra in advance before you write the airplane. You work out the algebra, you've got your control rule, so that your ADP system consists of a sophisticated critic network, which calculates your lambdas, and then for your actions, you just insert the algebraic equations. It's really easy. Balakrishnan calls this the single network adaptive critic. And by the way, he uses lambdas. This method is especially important because it's being used, for example, in missile interception. And in the application of missile interception, it has more than 10 times as much accuracy as anything that ever has been tried on hit to kill. And the use of this adaptive critic method in missile interception has been a really great technology story I'll, I'll get into when there's time, which is not today. Um, so that's method three only for certain special cases. Method two is only special cases. Number one, with the action network is very general and can also handle those special cases at the cost of an action network. Finally, of course, there is a hybrid, and I mentioned that's what I think the brain does, and there are many kinds of hybrid, and I think we need to do research to develop new kinds of hybrid. And, um, and I'm hoping you guys can participate in that research and help develop the software which makes it possible to combine these methods in a more flexible, powerful way. More expensive than that is the use of powerful operations research methods to come up with you. And this is something we're working on very actively right now uh, in, in the FedEx Institute in Memphis. There are application problems where you don't need to know the answer in a millisecond. Flying an airplane, you've got to have controls in a millisecond. But what if you're trying to build a fleet and you're trying to decide what the optimal fleet is and you have a year to decide what you're going to do. You have a year to solve the problem. In that case, you worry about accuracy. And if you have a very complex decision problem, much more complicated than an airplane, you may really need to do a lot of work at a high level of accuracy just for one time period. So even when you know the value function, 
Finding the value of u, which really maximizes that value function, is a difficult task, and you want to do really well on that task. So there's some applications where you want to use a very powerful operations research method to solve the problem of maximizing j at the next time period. So you can take the critic, the value function, and use that as the objective function for this operations research method. And, and it's just like what I said before with PIDs. You can tell people, I'm using Garobi, I'm using operations research to solve my problem, and I'm just using this ADP to provide an input to it. And the input is the value function or the critic, which gives you the foresight. On the other hand, you could say, oh, I'm doing ADP, and I'm just using this operations method as my action network equally valid ways of looking at it. Of course, in a case like that, you have to pick a critic network which gives you a function which these guys know how to maximize. And right now, if you have a general nonlinear function, a lot of the best methods in operations research won't work. So you have a choice. You can use today's most popular operations research methods and limit your critic to functions which it can understand. Find the best approximator of J within the space of functions that these guys know how to optimize. Or you can try to work on more powerful operations research methods which handle the nonlinear case. And basically for short-term work today you take the first approach. Use the existing powerful methods and you limit your critic, but for the future we need to work on more powerful nonlinear optimization methods that let us use better and more accurate critics to get better foresight. That's the real direction for the future, for best performance. The slowest method of all is to use evolutionary computing at every time step. And if you have the time to do it, if you can afford to do it, well, it'll give you good answers if you have the time to do it right. And sometimes you do. There are cases where people use evolutionary computing in each time cycle to come up with an action. Uh, I don't think it's that popular. I've only seen a couple of examples, but that's another possibility. So, to wind up this long lecture, if I'm not over time, I want to give one more slide today, which I'll talk about a lot more in the future about one of the other decisions. Let me come back to the question of which value function do you want to choose and what is the method you use to adapt the weights in that method. It turns out that there are say two broad classes of value function. The ones that have worked in practical applications already demanding important applications typically real world, but also relevant to the real world. They're the ones that people have implemented so far, and then they're the ones for the future which are good subjects for research. In the first category, there are really only four types, three or four types, that people have had success with. So these are the three or four that you need to think of in the real world, and I've already mentioned them a little bit and I'm going to talk about them more right now. There are methods to approximate the J star function. Some people call this the value function, but actually these are all value functions. With the J star function, there are three primary methods that we need to talk about. One of them is the method that I call heuristic dynamic programming. I showed you that briefly on a flowchart. I'll talk a lot more about it next time when we get into how to implement it. It is the easiest and it's also very, very general. And basically it's something I developed way back in 1971, but the Handbook of Intelligent Control gives a much more systematic treatment than any of the earlier papers. The Handbook of Intelligent Control is the best source for what is heuristic dynamic programming. Then there is GDHP, 
which stands for Globalized Dual Heuristic Programming. I'll explain why later. It's obvious why this is heuristic dynamic programming. It's dynamic programming approximated. GDHP also approximates JSTAR, but basically HDP approximates JSTAR by minimizing the error in the Bellman equation. GDHP approximates J star by minimizing a sum of the error in the Bellman equation and the error in the gradient or derivatives of the Bellman equation. And by minimizing that more sophisticated error function, it achieves higher accuracy, greater power. So GDHP is more complicated, more difficult. That's why I won't start with it. But it's also the best method in principle when you have a mix of continuous and discrete variables. HDP also works with a mixture of discrete and continuous variables. But GDHP takes advantage of the derivatives of the continuous variables. Of course, the discrete variables don't have the derivatives. So um, you can't include their derivatives in the error function because they don't have any. But in principle, this is the best method for a mix of continuous and discrete variables. It turns out that a special case of GDHP winds up having very simple algebra, much simpler than the general case. And that special case has been used very effectively by Warren Powell, who re-derived it from a different perspective many years later. And when you use this special case of GDHP, it gives the very best solutions that anybody has ever found for some very large-scale problems in operations research and logistics. I was very excited years ago when I went to the operations research conference and there was Warren Powell describing the breakthroughs he'd had doing much better in these kinds of problems than anyone had ever done before with real-world applications like the logistics for the first phase of the Afghan war, which was the successful phase, and applications in trucking, and he's got a fair amount of money from industry there in Princeton to follow on. So GDHP is a critical method, but the general case is more powerful, and we can do better than what he's done in the past. There's lots of room for you folks to do better than what anybody has done, simply by doing more general applications of things that have already produced good results. A third method in this class is something called TD, or Temporal Difference Methods. The term TD, Temporal Difference Methods, first appeared in a paper in 1990 by a guy named Sutton. And I mentioned earlier a book called Neural Networks for Control, edited by Miller, Sutton, and Werbos. We worked together. We had a workshop in 1988 funded by NSF. And Sutton looked at the earlier work on heuristic dynamic programming and GDHP, and he added a certain tweak to it and communicated it and implemented it all across computer science. So there are lots of people in computer science who are very familiar with the term TD and talk about temporal difference methods, and it's basically the same as HDP with a very slight tweak added, uh, which he calls lambda, but I won't get into that because it, it really isn't very important to the applications we're talking about. This has generated a whole lot of good pedagogic work, a lot of good tools for learning. The only practical difficult application I'm aware of was to a game playing machine used for backgammon. In a sense it's like the chess application, except this time it was a real adaptive critic with real adaptation of weights doing a good job in playing the game of backgammon, which is fairly famous. So that is the J-star type of critic. Very important today. The next is the Lambda kind of critic. And back in 1979, I published a paper describing a new method, radically different from what anybody had ever done before, called dual heuristic programming, which estimates the Lambdas instead of J-star. And it turns out to do that, you basically have to differentiate the Bellman equation to derive an adaptation rule to adapt these values, or lambda. This is the method which has worked best in continuous variables. 
it's easier to use than GDHP. So you don't see many comparisons of GDHP with DHP because GDHP has not yet been implemented much that way. There have been some new papers from China, which maybe I need to study more. But the papers a few years ago were all showing DHP was the winner when you have continuous variables. So that's what Balakrishnan used in missile interception that's revolutionizing that field. There's also a benchmark paper by Wunsch, Santiago, and Prokhorov, which I've urged you to look at. That, that paper probably belongs right next to the Handbook of Intelligent Control and the Lewis book as a key resource for understanding that field because he does a very straightforward benchmark test of the different ADP methods and DHP works best in continuous variables. This is also the method that was used by Stengel. Now I mentioned Stengel, one of the world's leaders in optimal control and aerospace control. And he and Ferrari did a project a few years ago where they used DHP to get better performance on difficult aircraft maneuvers than anybody had ever achieved before with previous methods. And that's really remarkable because remember, Stengel really knows the best existing state of the art in existing methods. And when Stengel reports you can get better performance in aerospace maneuvers using DHP, that is a very important achievement worth noticing. And Ferrari has followed on doing a lot of important work saving airplanes. So DHP is a good method also. A third very important method is something I've only mentioned a little bit, um, which is based on a different value function which was developed way back 1989. It was developed at the same time in parallel by two different people, really independently. Uh, a guy named Watkins in England who did a PhD thesis and there was me working with a team of people at NSF. Uh, I call it J prime, he called it Q, and the, they're both good sources. They're basically the same function, but the methods I proposed and the methods he proposed were different for what to do with this value function. This function, which you call J prime or Q, is defined by the following equation. And this equation basically says it all. We define a new value function, which is a function not only of the state x, but of the action little q. Sorry, little u. So the j prime or q value is a function of your current action and your current state defined by this function, which is your big utility function plus the expected value of j hat of t plus 1. So, because of time, I'm going to continue this discussion into the next lecture. I'll talk a little bit more about what we conclude at the end of this and then get into neural network issues and implementation for the simplest of these methods. I will start with the oldest and the simplest and the history of the simple method, HDP. Thank you.